Well, good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I'm a distinguished professor of the practice in the School of Public Policy uh, here at Northeastern University. And uh, you are uh, tuned into the open classroom, which this semester uh, is being uh, co-taught uh, by uh, me as a professor of uh, public policy um, and uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Abdul Mustafa, who is uh, a professor of uh, engineering. Um, we're really pleased to uh, be able to present tonight um, a panel that is uh, going to talk about a particular piece of construction that uses um, a, a, an evaluative platform that we've talked about over the course of this semester. Um, that is the Envision program uh, uh, for uh, assessing metrics of what the impact uh, of a, a construction project may be um, on the surrounding community. And with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to my colleague, uh, Professor Mustafa, who will uh, begin the uh, process of introducing our panelists. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you. Um, um, we uh, are happy to see you here again. And, uh, this kind of, uh, we are mixing theory and practice. We have been talking about uh, the Envision framework. So tonight we are going to have an example. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's an example um, in our own backyard, Northeastern University. So we are happy to have our guests here. And I want this time to give them a chance to, to tell us about uh, themselves. So the introduction is going to go from our panel. And I'm going to start with Cassandra. So Cassandra, please tell us. Uh, a bit about you and your work. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having us uh, this evening. I'm Cassandra McKenzie. I am the Associate Vice President of Real Estate and Capital Projects in the Planning, Real Estate, and Facilities Division here at Northeastern University. Um, I'm here representing our Chief and Vice President, Kathy Spiegelman. And I am responsible for a team of about 55 professionals here at the university. And we basically manage uh, all of the built environment uh, and the assets for Northeastern, both here in Boston and globally. So our team is uh, pretty busy. And I'm joined by my colleagues here, and I'll have them introduce themselves. Um, so I'm Jacqueline Valencia. I'm a senior project manager here. I work in capital projects for Cassandra. I'm one of those 55 professionals. Um, and so I work on uh, new construction, fit out projects, um, and manage them. And we uh, brought on Skanska as a building partner for this project. So Jillian's here. Uh, let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jillian Conarachi. I work for Skanska, the gen oh, there we go. Yeah, that's me uh, at the bridge. Um, I don't know what I'm turning on. <laughs> Um, so Skanska is a general contractor, so Northeastern was looking for someone to build a bridge, and we bid the job, we won, and then um, I was a field engineer at the time, so I was out of school maybe five years, you know, I had a civil engineering degree from UConn, and I was responsible on checking on our carpenters, making sure they had enough materials, making sure I, just planning the whole job, um, and right now I'm, um, I'm a cost manager on Route 146 for Skanska, so with Skanska, I've built a power plant, a railroad, a tunnel, a, um, a building, an elevator. I've built a lot of things. And so that's like the great thing about working for a contractor is that every job's different and you get to learn so much about so many things. Can both of you also say something about your background, how you So I think he's alluding to the fact that I went to Northeastern. <laughs> um, so I have my undergrad in uh, architecture here, and then I, I went back and got my MBA at night, um, which Northeastern very graciously paid for. <laughs> um, and so, you know, double husky, but, but yeah. Um, started here um, in architecture. So I have a different background than, than the engineers in the group um, with architecture and business. I am also a double husky. I have a civil engineering degree from Northeastern 
and I have a leadership and management degree, um, Master of Science. And I have originally started here, I'm sure um, Professor Landsberg is trying to hint that I, my first stint at Northeastern uh, started in 1999 uh, and did 20 years, basically uh, doing the development for the university. Started out in uh, West Village. This, one of the, this building is one of the projects that uh, I was on the management team for. And we turned the parking lot uh, into this beautiful campus oasis that you are taking advantage of today. Um, and then I left for a while and I went to work for a quasi-government organization called Mass Development. Uh, with Mass Development, I led the real estate team and the Mass Development is basically responsible for the development uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Learned a lot, um, really got in and understood community and uh, economic development. And now that I'm back at Northeastern, I'm able to take some of those learnings and apply it here so that, you know, helping the university be a better uh, corporate citizen for our neighbors uh, surrounding us in Boston. So we're going to jump in. Uh, and, and just so you know, and we have colleagues here who are our experts in climate justice, uh, environmental justice. Uh, what we represent is really more the built um, environment uh, portion of planning real estate and facilities. And we have a whole team dedicated, um, led by Leah Bamberger, and hopefully you are and have taken um, part in some of the many programs that they have going on uh, around campus. Um, we are going to just talk to you more as, a, as practitioners uh, and help you understand. We've, I've slid, I slid in a few slides on the sites program as well. Uh, primarily, we're going to talk to you about Envision because I understand you've been uh, discussing that in your classes. But we have also um, taken, we also have site certification um, on one of our projects, Carter Field. So we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But I'm going to turn it over now to Jacqueline and we're going to start walking through the Envision program for the pedestrian bridge. Thanks, Cassandra. <laughs> Just going to walk over here so I can see what I'm looking at. All right, so I think we covered this already, um, but you know, I, I started my um, career in design and shifted into project management. I think some of you might be project management students, um, so I did not go to school for project management. I um, shifted into it in real time in my career, uh, thanks to Cassandra. Um, she brought me on board for ISCC, um, and so I had some knowledge of you know the adjacency uh, to the bridge and um, was able to shift onto that project. Uh, so this is a slide pulled from our 2013 um, institutional master plan. Um, and so we're due for a new one. Um, we're required to do one every 10 years. And so um, we're currently working on that. Hopefully you all got an email for my campus survey and you gave some good input and we can um, you know, take that into account when we develop the, the new plan. But this really shows you how far we've come. Um, we're, you know, we're talking about this site here. We had a huge surface parking lot um, previously. Um, and this master plan really talked about developing this site for buildings, for research buildings, um, but also talking about how we circulate um, people through. So there was a proposed bridge as part of um, this IMP. Um, I think it had two touch points. We had maybe three buildings on the, on the site. We do our best to, to make a, a good guess about development. Um, and then um, execute as best we can. So you can see we're you know, adjacent to the MBTA here and we've got this um, you know, set of tracks that are really dividing our campus and the community um, between Columbus Ave and Huntington. And so the routes that people were taking through campus were really not ideal. We had um, circulation through parking garages. Um, there used to be a pedestrian uh, crossing along the uh, Ruggles uh, busway. And so you'd be right up against the, the busway. Um, for future development, we were planning how students would get there. And that, that access actually dumped you right into future potential loading docks. Um, and so we really wanted to elevate students and elevate the community um, and bring them across uh, the tracks in a, in a convenient and safe way. 
Um, so this is a, a slide that shows just components of the project and it's a snapshot in time because you can see <laughs> there's still, you know, half of the lot is a parking lot. If you walk out there today, there's a new project going up. Um, we do have um, a neighbor, like I said, the MBTA here. We had a service drive to cross. We had four railroad tracks, another service drive, loading dock here. And so getting students all the way from here across, you know, to class and back to a library um, was really the problem that we were trying to solve. And so the, pedest the pedestrian crossing project came from that problem. Um, you can see, you know, we did um, an infrastructure project along this uh, line right here where it says platform extension. Um, it allowed the MBTA to do their extension work as well. So if you walk out there today, there's a commuter rail um, exit. You can get off the commuter rail there. Um, and then on the south side, we're doing a lot of work here. So um, we are reworking it a little bit. We've got some elevation changes based on EXP. Um, and so you'll see this part's behind a, a construction fence, but this part is all open and you can walk across it today. So for pedestrian crossing, we, like um, Jillian said, we had bid it out. Um, we had PAYAD on board, they had done ISCC. We decided to keep them on board to oversee the design and have AREP come on and do the bridge design. They have great experts um, in bridge design all over the world. Um, Skanska, you know, submitted a bid and it, it was really, I think, one of the defining decisions to bring them on board because they have been just the best partner to work with. Um, but I think it was also critical um, you know, Jillian's going to talk about the logistics of the, the project a little bit and the reasons that it, you know, improved safety, improved um, the actual execution of it. But I think the, you know, the moment they came on board, they said, we want to look at this Envision project. And so I think as, a, as an Envision project, and so I think, you know, without them, it, we wouldn't have the search. So here's Jillian. She's going to explain how she executed it. Does it work? Can you guys hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, so I already talked about myself. I don't know if I said I went to UConn. <laughs> you guys catch that? <laughs> the game was on too late for me. I couldn't watch it past my bedtime. But I watched the game before, like the, the game before. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually from Pennsylvania. My dream was to live in New York. I did that. I was living in Manhattan. And then all of a sudden, Something was like, I want to move to Boston. And everyone's like, why are you moving to Boston? And uh, I don't know why, but I moved. And I got to work with these great individuals. And I love working at Northeastern. Just like all the facility guys were so great to me, just walking around, you know, cleaning the yard. It was just a, such a great experience. And um, now I live and work in Rhode Island. So it's kind of like a fun full circle. Um, OK, so the bridge. Who likes it? Yeah, right? I know, right? What would you do without it? Um, so I tell you, though, that parking lot, when we, before we built the bridge, and I had to go meet them for meetings over there, you had to like, it, the sun's pouring down, the pavement's shining up, and you had to walk around. It was horrible. So I think this br <laughs> the bridge is beautiful. I love it, and the, the landscape, and it was such a great job. Like, she, like uh, Jacqueline said, there was five train tracks. So that, this, this project was difficult because you can't just fly a bridge in. You know, you have to shut down the power on the tracks. You have to be like, hey, MBTA schedule some buses because you're going to be rerouting people because it's going to be shut down for the night, you know? It's like a, and then the Amtrak, you know, like, you know how you take your Amtrak, down, you had to cancel, they had to change the schedules. It was like a big to-do. So, Skanska came in, I think, yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is, this is, this is a good, there's a lot to take in here. So, the biggest thing is the crane. You see how big that crane is? It took us like two weeks to build, okay? All the counterweights and the, the boom, it was so long, it barely fit in the yard, okay? It, 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 the biggest crane we could have. Why the big crane? It's because we wanted to limit the number of occurrences of uh, interacting with the track. So working over the track is very risky. Uh, the original plan was to have multiple weekends, and we would do a little bit, a little bit, a little bit for a long duration, but that's very risky. We thought, how about one weekend, Everyone's all in, you know, we're going to plan this so hard and we're just going to lift it in the two spans and that would be it. So that's what we did. So we, we built the bridge in the yard. We, weld, we had all the guys welding it. We had the little crane there supporting this 
holding the seal, we will weld it together. And then um, we had the big day, the big night. And we flew it in with the big crane and it went perfectly. Typically when you have a big, big pick like that, everything goes well because you're just planning it so much. You're thinking about everything that could go wrong. So when you have a big critical pick like that, that's what happened. Um, so we had two picks that went in perfectly. And um, after that, we had a concrete pour and, and uh, installing the, the glass between the panels. But it, besides that, it was more, um, not, it wasn't as many interruptions. Okay, so I think you guys know about Envision, right? I've heard. I'm like the expert, not really, but like I did do the Envision package at Skanska and for the project. Um, I'm not like an expert, but I do know it pretty well and I read the master plan because that's pretty much where I found all my information. So you, got, you understand it's a rating system. Do you know what the difference is between Envision and uh, being LEED certified? Yeah? Okay. So, you, okay. so Envision helps you. Yeah. Okay. So lead, being LEED certified is only for a building. So if, what if you're building a, like a power plant or a bridge and you want to figure out a way, like, am I building a sustainable structure? That's what they made Envision because before it would only apply to buildings. It's like, great job, you building, you know, but what about all the other things? Everything you think about the highways, use infrastructure for, yeah, oh, you might live in a building and we're in a building right now, but highways, tunnels, that's like, that's how you get and you live your life. So Envision helps you, are we doing the project right? And then also, are we doing the right project? So for, for my experience on, on this job, Typically, Envision should be done more in the beginning of the job, like in the design phase, but Skanska proposed it, so we did it in the construction phase. So pretty much the design was already done, and there was only so many things that we can control. So in my aspect, it was, it was like, um, obviously this is the right project, but how can we tweak it to make it more sustainable? And um, in 2018, the job, uh, the project got a bronze level of standard, which was monumental. <laughs> Twenty percent. Oh, actually, I'll go on the next slide. Yeah, right here. So on the bottom. Um, so there's four levels of standing. Uh, we got the lowest level, but we're still on the podium. Um, so it's a percentage of points achieved. So let's say you have 100 points, and maybe like 20 of them are not applicable. Like you can't be, those are out of the question. So now I have 80. So 20% out of the 80, that's how many points that we scored, but for, for example. Um, so for Envision, there's 60 credits total, and there's five categories. So category one is quality of life, two is leadership, resource allocation, natural world, and climate and resistance, uh, resilience. Um, so in those five categories, then the 60 credits are kind of shaken out in between. And then there's five different levels of achievement. So let's say there's a, a credit in quality of life. If you reach the restorative level, you can get 20 points. But if you get improved, you only get two points. So that was one of our problems. Like maybe we were getting in the improved enhanced level, but we never really got to the restorative, like the, the bigger chunks, like the bigger parts of the points. So that's why we were we got the lower level of achievement. Any questions on this one? Okay, so I'm just gonna go into it a little a little deep, a little bit more detail. You guys let me know how much detail you want me to go into. But for quality of life, the, the top five, these are where we, we earned most of our points. So we got 50 out of 181 points, so that was 28%. That's actually, this is our second best uh, category. Um, enhanced public health and safety. Like I said, we changed our construction sequence. So instead of having multiple weekends where multiple people could get hurt, we just had one weekend to, to uh, wreck the bridge. So um, I wrote that up and we got, we got high points for that. Minimalize light pollution. So on the, when you, next time when you walk over the bridge, um, the, we have the um, energy saving light fixtures and then I had, it's set up so that when the sun is about to rise, the lights automatically turn off so you're saving energy. Before the sun sets, it turns the lights on. Um, and then the aluminum shield, it reduces spillage. So if you take a look when you, I don't know if you're gonna see it or not, but it helps direct the light so it directs on the path and uh, it just, you know, illuminates the walking space better. Improved community mobility and access. Um, obviously before, if you were handicapped, you weren't able to go over those steps. So now we have a handicap ramp and then we have the elevator to bring you down. Encourage ultimate modes of transportation. Uh, it shortened the, the travel distance between the North and South Campus and it encourages non-motorized transportation. Instead of hailing a cab, I'll just walk across or use my bike or skateboard. 
enhanced public space, the bridge replaced an existing parking lot and restored it too. So that was, that was a big point for us as well. Lessons learned. Uh, we could have gathered feedback from the community and key stakeholders to be more integrate in the design. That was, um, so like I said, we started thinking about this once the design was already done. So learning lessons, if we could do it again, we would definitely, um, we did have some meetings with Northeastern, but it wasn't with the, the key stakeholders in, in the, the community. Um, we would also develop plans to hire locally. That was um, a, big, a big part. And uh, preserve views and local character by documenting efforts and policy changes and regulation. So um, yeah, we, I know that there, the architect was trying to um, preserve the view with how the bridge looked and orientated itself. But besides that, we, we didn't, they didn't reach out to any um, registration. Any questions on this one? Okay, next one. Leadership, um, so provide effective leadership and um, commitment. Northeastern was awarded the Greenest University at one point. I don't know what year that was, was it 2016? Yeah. Okay, I, it's not now, but it, in 2016, I think Northeastern was the Greenest University, um, so that helped us. Um, foster collaboration and teamwork, so we held meetings with our steel fabricator because it, it was a very risky, item and that helped us gain some points. Stakeholder involvement, active community relations with the Northeastern facility, the student body, and we had some public hearings. Improved infrastructure. Um, so like Jacqueline was saying, we had that one wall. It was a, the wall supported the bridge, but then also it supported the platform. So there we go, we gained some points on that. And then um, the bridge, it long-term monitoring. The, it's weathering steel, so you don't need to paint it. So that saved us points as, as well because you're being sustainable in that aspect. Uh, and the, the, uh, the glass is self-cleaning. I don't know if you guys knew this, I don't know that or not. Self-cleaning, check it out. <laughs> it's still a little foggy sometimes, but overall it cleans itself. Learning lessons. Um, we would establish a, a sustainability management system. We, we did have some integration with um, the sustainability program at Northeastern, but we didn't have to the level that we needed it to be at the point at that point. And address conflicting regulations and policies. Um, we, we, we didn't go about trying to change any laws or policies on, on this project, but that, that could have, if we wanted to, that, that would have been a good um, option. Okay, resource allocation. Um, we scored 15% on this one. Uh, so recycled material, the whole the whole bridge, the steel, that was recycled material. So we're able to gain points on that. Reduced excavated material. Um, we didn't really haul any material off site. It was like a net zero. So the the material that we excavated, we put into the hill, and we kind of worked with the designer to like make it so it was net zero. Um, commissions and monitoring energy systems. We, the I tell you, Northeastern commissioning team, they were a pleasure to work with, and they reviewed everything. They made sure that. Every, that they agreed with it, that they were going to be able to implement it. It was very good communication. How can we get better? Um, reduce the net embodied energy, reduce energy consumption, and use more renewable energy in the future. Um, natural world, 100% um, of the project was on a previous um, developed land, so that, that was a good point for us. And uh, we reduced some pesticides by using um, the plant. We're using a planting soil that required a low water usage. So yeah, we only got two points on that one, um, or we only scored in two categories there. Learning lessons would be managing stormwater, um, controlling invasive species. We would have to get documentation from a local agency saying that there was no invasive species on our project. So. That that was like kind of a lot to do at that moment. We, you know, a lot of time probably that took. Um, and preserve biodiversity, um, to provide documentation from the state or local agencies, demonstrating that there are no valuable habitat. I tried really hard on this one, but I could, oh, oh, what did I do? It may have been the special button that we wasn't sure, we weren't sure what, what it did. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, she's back. Okay, if you just okay. hit it again, it comes back. <laughs> okay. And then the last one, climate and resilience. We only scored 3% 3, 3 on this one. Um, manage heat, heat island effects. So we had 85% of services exposed to sunlight have an SRI value of less than 92. If we had, if we were up 
if we were at 90%, we would have gotten two more points instead of four. So, you know, we were just a very low scoring. This one was a hard one for us. How could we get better if we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, excess climate threat, avoid traps and vulnerabilities, and prepare for short-term hazards? So, yeah, I think that was all I had. Yeah, does it, do we want to answer any questions now, or any questions on a vision? After, okay, we're gonna go to, sorry, okay. Thanks, it's always hard following Jillian with that energy, but I'm gonna try my best. Uh, so Carter Field and Playground. This is, uh, and I wanna say publicly, still is, always was, a city of Boston Park. Uh, Northeastern, there is, it's about 6.5 acres. Um, Northeastern did remain owner of about 25%, 1.5 acres of it. Uh, that was part of the contribution to creating a more expansive uh, surface area for the park. But that's, you know, just want to say that out, <laughs> get that out there. Um, so a just a couple of slides, we wanted to also share with you that in addition to Envision, we have a uh, site certification, it's called SITES, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's SITES Initiative Certification on Carter. Uh, and so as I mentioned, uh, Carter is at part of the 2013 Institutional Master Plan that Jacqueline was talking about. Um, we propose that we do a community benefit and investment in Carter Field to um, bring it up to a, you know, a, a better standard and a better quality for the community. Uh, Northeastern, the capital project uh, was in totality was a little under 26 million and 80 million uh, over the course of 30 years for operating costs. So Northeastern maintains with our facility staff the park for the city of Boston. Uh, we main, uh, we own, we operate and maintain all of those structures. Um, and this was done by what we call a reciprocal license agreement with the city, and the term of the agreement is 30 years. And if you've been there, you know there are two multi-use fields. They can, they're very, um, they can go football, soccer, baseball, lacrosse. The five tennis courts was an upgrade. Uh, they had four. We, uh, they, they wanted to start competition and for the competition um, to, you know, platform, you needed at least five tennis courts for that. So we were able to include that. And the thing that I'm most proud of about this project is the playground. The playground used to be in the back uh, that, what was the back um, up in this corner here? And it was um, not maintained very well. It was, um, prone for uh, activity that was not uh, conducive to child play. Uh, and so we wanted to bring it up front and center uh, so that the community could use it. And it includes uh, several play equipment for children with disabilities. And I know that that area is very well used. So the sites, um, Sustainable Sites Initiative uh, it's basically, this, it's a rating system that is dedicated, that evaluates uh, and certifies uh, basically landscape and outdoor spaces. So we talked about the bridge being a structure, you know, a certification for a structure that is not a building, and SITES is a certification for uh, more of a landscape type project, and Carter fit into that. And like many times, like Skanska bringing Envision to Northeastern. Uh, the sites program was brought to us by the architect Stantec uh, and said that you know there's there are no site certified uh, spaces in Boston. I think I want to go as far as saying you know, in the on the East Coast, but I won't. But I know in Boston we are the first site certified uh, property. And some of the things that helped us uh, acquire you know obtain certification. The underneath the tennis courts here is a cistern, and it's about 14,000 gallons. And basically, the runoff from the uh, tennis courts goes into, um, you know, percolates down into the cistern, 
and we use that water to basically irrigate the property. And it's, a, it's anticipated that 150,000 yeah, 150, gallons are being saved annually by using that uh, system. A lot of the vegetation that you'll see is um, you know, placed and, and a lot of the natural um, stone and products, um, the perviousness of some of the material in the playground, uh, the drainage system for the seasonal air structure when it goes up, it's all collected underground and it is um, such that you know, it'll lessen the impact to the in infrastructure um, that, you know, for the city of Austin. So that's primarily the, the reason for us going for it is so that we could um, basically help to preserve this natural resource for the city of Austin. Now we'll open up to Questions? We know there are some. There are lots of questions about um, why it is that uh, a university would um, uh, step in and care about these uh, systems rather than just um, building without reference to them. Um, tell us a little bit about the interaction between uh, the university and uh, some of the other partners that were involved and how they may or may not have uh, responded. For example, uh, did the MBTA express any interest in um, utilizing any of these metrics or systems? Uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, what goes on within uh, the private sector firms, whether it's uh, Payette or, or, or Skanska. Um, that has uh, incentivized them to uh, utilize these systems in order to assess the impacts. So a bunch of questions, and you can answer them in a, uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so, yeah, we got to give credit to Skanska for bringing in vision to us um, and saying, you know, we should do this. Um, you know, I think the university took it on as in saying, you know, this is important. But like Jillian said, I think we wanted it earlier, right? So we're only getting better at this. Um, a lot of the points where, you know, we talk about, you know, our sustainability group, we've just come miles, I think, from where we were. Um, and so, you know, we're grateful for our partners pushing us this way and then, you know, how we can support it. Um, and I think, you know, Payette did a good job as a partner in helping us write some of these things. You know, Jillian wrote a lot of them that were, you know, logistics driven or, you know, builder um, input. But I think having a designer that can, you know, Stimson, you know, did the, the landscape design, um, you know, talk about biodiversity, et cetera. They, you know, can give you narratives that really, you know, feed into the application. You want to build on that? Yeah. Um, so actually, the first time we applied, we got denied. I didn't tell you guys that. So <laughs> that was like a big wake up call because I submitted it and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Um, so I had a, I worked a lot of weekends and I had to rethink about how I was going to approach this and um, then we were, I was waiting patiently and then we got the bronze standard. So um, it, the, I was able to, there, the master plan, working with the architects, that was very helpful and then just, you know, talking to my superintendents and them identifying things that necessarily I didn't think about. Um, the reason why does why does Skanska do this? I think it's just for us to it's kind of put it on our resume when we go to clients and you know at LaGuardia, you guys know that airport in New York. There's like two dedicated people to do envision on that project. Like that's all they do is that I did I did this bridge like on the weekends or when I'm done with my work. It was it was it was a struggle, but when you have two dedicated people, like that's their job is to like point these things out and document it and it's like the life of the project. That's why Skanska does it is because, you know, it, it's your, your, that's how we win the jobs is because we, we're going to be doing this for, for a long time. We're going to make a difference. You know? Just to build on that, again, uh, it is, we do rely on a lot of our consultants and partners to bring things like this. They are in the industry. Uh, we are, you know, owners, educators, and so we rely on our, our partner, industry partners to um, 
bring forward some of this and keep us progressive. And as you know, we talked earlier about you know um, walking the talk, right? It's not we have to be about it, right? As a university, uh, to just make sure that we are at the forefront of um, resiliency, sustainability. Uh, and now that we have this a whole department dedicated, I think the sky is just the limit now for us on that. Universities are going to be around for a while. Uh, we've had universities in the world for a thousand years, longer than a lot of other institutions. And usually their physical plants don't move very much. So when a university builds something, uh, it, it builds it with uh, what is often a hundred year time frame, uh, rather than uh, building on a, a 10 year time frame, as um, that might be the, the case with a lot of commercial real estate developers who build a building, depreciate it for tax purposes, and then flip it uh, to someone else because it, it's no longer a value to them. What do you think it would take? I understand the business proposition for Skanska in terms of having a competitive edge as against their other um, uh, builder uh, uh, competitors when they say, oh, we can do this kind of work. But what would it take for private sector, non-university, non-long-term builders uh, to begin to uh, take on these kinds of standards with metrics that basically hold the builder accountable or the owner accountable for improving the environment over the long term. So I think you touched on it, you know, Northeastern is going to be here for a long time. Um, and so when we do build things, we build it with a consciousness that we are our own neighbor. <laughs> you know, we live in the community that we're building in. Um, and I think that, you know, that inherent nature of wanting to be a good neighbor with the, the, your, um, you know, the adjacencies that you have. We have, you know, residential community nearby. We've got um, the MBTA. Um, and I think, you know, we want, we want to make sure that we're a good neighbor. So if you're going to incentivize private companies, I think you need to give them a good reason to be a good neighbor. Um, and I don't know exactly what the answer is to that, um, whether it's financial or... Um, you know, shame goes a long way, um, but I think if it's PR and it's, it, it makes it a good business decision to be a good neighbor, um, that's probably going to be a successful regulatory um, intervention. I'll add to that that as the university, we think more in terms of life cycle cost. Uh, and while it, you know, there's a certain value, the capital investment uh, to the facility, there's uh, the added operating and maintenance cost. And so you want to establish a system by which we can operate and maintain it uh, more economically. And putting in these types of systems helps us do that, right? Um, having a understanding of what it takes to maintain the facility uh, is something that, you know, if you let your facility go, it's going to be a little more costly, right, to then bring it up, deferred maintenance. You know, you have to monitor that as the capital cost. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and we talked about it earlier, is, um, you know, what role does policy play in this, in, you know, in this question? And I do think uh, we're seeing a, a trend and a, and a transformation, even just in Boston, uh, with the Wu administration, and some of the most recent um, requirements that she has implemented or try, is trying to implement uh, on the development world. And I think as an industry, you know, it takes sometimes that sort of um, nudge in order to help people realize that they should be better corporate citizens. Uh, and that's, you know, the net zero um, requirement, uh, just the workforce pipeline requirements, um, making sure that you have members of underrepresented communities on your team, all of that plays into making you, know, this a, you, you a better partner uh, and making these sustainable moves.
Well, I, but I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on one of the comments you made in reference to uh, community engagement and um, what it is you might have learned if uh, you had engaged more broadly, perhaps, or uh, more deeply uh, with the community, understanding that the community has uh, many elements and stakeholders. There's a university community, um, there's the residential community in the area, uh, there is the community of businesses um, who uh, uh, constitute the realm of uh, building in Greater Boston. This was a pretty unique project. We don't build a lot of bridges in Boston, first of all. Um, and, and we rarely, if ever, build bridges that require collaboration with um, uh, a, um, a federal or uh, a nationally oriented entity such as Amtrak and a local transportation agency such as the MBTA. So um, there, there was a leadership role that was assumed by the university in moving forward to build this bridge in the way it was built. You could have built a much more boring, uh, aesthetically banal uh, uh, bridge across those, those tracks. There's a lot of risk involved here. So what are the other things that you think you might have learned in retrospect from engaging with those multiple other communities? So I do think that this point, um, is a good lesson learned for any of us going, you know, going into the practicing world. Um, you got to do the work, but you got to document it too. And so, you know, we put our IMP together with community engagement. And what we did not do is document it in meeting notes in a way that could be added to an application and then therefore counted. You know, uh, Jillian talked about we, we submitted our first application and didn't get it. It's not because the project didn't um, achieve those points. It's because we had to find, track down uh, the documentation from years past um, to really bolster the argument. Um, I think, you know, anytime a project is done, um, you think back on how much you could have done more. And I think, would we have learned something different if we had done additional community engagement? Probably. Um, and I think, you know, going forward, we, we try to be as um, outward reaching as we possibly can. Um, and so, yeah, we're in, we're in that process right now with our 2023 uh, IMP. So hopefully we do a better job of documenting it this time around. I'm just curious, would you consider um, uh, doing videos of, of those oh, community interactions? I mean, it's yeah. just so easy to set up an iPhone or something like that. What I, what I love about that is that it's documented as it happened and not through the filter of meeting notes, right? So like at Northeastern, if we're a bias, you know, we, everyone has a bias when they have their own filter. And so if you had a record like that, I, I'd love that idea of a, of a video record. I'll speak for a minute about Carter because we did do that. Uh, and we had a community process that was... Um, there was some online and some in person because not everyone had uh, technology to participate. But there was that option in case you didn't want to come out. And it basically gave you an opportunity to, uh, I'll call it vote for lack of a better term, on some of the options that we were proposing for Carter. We, we did go through the uh, process and we had several community meetings and we heard uh, from the community uh, we weren't, you know, we were the leader in the development, but we were not, you know, it was a city park. And so therefore, um, the Parks and Recreation basically had the final say in what the design actually included. But one thing, and I don't know if any of you have taken part of the most recent um, environmental justice training, but I have. And the, one of the biggest takeaways from that is uh, trying to meet people where they are instead of having them come to us. And so I think a takeaway from this process, I think maybe we might have gone out into the community instead of hosting, hosting community meetings here on campus. I think that might have, been, might have been a little more fruitful. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, just in, in reference to that last point, um, when I worked in city government, we were trying to uh, engage communities in violence reduction programs, and we realized that we could hold meetings um, in, in city buildings, or we could go out to barber shops and uh, 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 beauty uh, uh, salons and to laundromats, uh, where people are kind of trapped for a period of time. Um, you know, if, if you go to a supermarket, people want to come and go. Um, but if you can connect in a community with uh, uh, religious and spiritual groups or daycare centers where people are waiting or what have you, that there is an opportunity, in fact, um, to engage people when they're more open and willing uh, to, uh, uh, to engage with you rather than holding the meeting with a bunch of boards uh, on, on a university property where the community people, uh, including students and faculty, may not feel comfortable uh, coming into that kind of setting to share their honest and authentic feelings about something that they might not like. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, by this presentation because you guys talked about the sites, you talked about the structures, and you know that we have lead. So it's really um, very um, good to know that Northeastern University is doing this because you, we're not just doing the building, but we're doing the sites. We're also doing the infrastructure. In the class, we, we discuss in vision, and we have version 3 of, of the manual. So by the way, you guys have got the difficult version, that because that's version 2. And in vision at that time, because it was new rating system, uh, I can imagine the difficulty of the submission. So I really want to commend you for bringing this to, to, to the Northeastern University. Uh, and we didn't know that uh, this, this bridge has uh, been satisfied by Envision after we started this class. Uh, so now there is verification for Envision. Uh, I happen to be one of the trainers. I train people to, to be a uh, sustainability professional. Uh, so your job was difficult because version 2 was difficult. This is version 3 now because you have verification, you have people to help you out. So thank you for doing that. I am interested in, in, in the delivery methods of, of this project because it seems you guys have a really uh, fantastic working relationship. And you demonstrate that in front of us here. So um, what kind of delivery system was this? this kind, was it kind of construction management at risk? How did you guys got involved in this? Because you are coming from the construction side and you, you kind of suggest it to the planners and the designers, why don't you go for Envision, right? So I think this is very interesting. Uh, so what kind of delivery system was that? What kind of contractual arrangement was that, if you can remember? Yes. So I think you would consider it CM at risk. I mean, we had them. Yeah, so I mean, we did the design and, uh, you know, sent it out to Skanska and a couple of other partners to, you know, receive bids back. Um, and in, so instead of it being something where you're helping us with the design, um, I think it was really about it being, a, you know, a bid project that you submit on. I think our, like your logistics plans were very different from other uh, submissions and it just set you apart from, from them. Um, I think you went above and beyond what could be expected from a, a submission like this. Um, it really rethought the execution of the project um, beyond what we would have um, anticipated. Um, yeah, I, am I explaining that in a, in a way that makes sense? I, I wasn't at the job at that point, so um, I'm not sure how it, how it actually happened, um, but I do know you know, that we took the initiative, like we, we financed the application, and um, I do, um, I know that. Um, <laughs> construction manager at risk basically just means exactly that. The, con the construction manager basically uh, takes on the risk of the project. 
they manage all of the trades um, <clears throat> involved in the project. And uh, for this project, I believe we had Garrett. We had a GSA coach. I, you know, I can't remember, to be honest, but typically we have a guaranteed maximum price. And so they do the bid documents and they um, come to a, a value that basically they say to the university and we sign on the dotted line that says we will, we will deliver this project for this amount. <clears throat> and they have obviously there's a ton of backup in that for them, but uh, they assume they have um, contractor insurance policies, they have, they take on this safety for the, for the site. Uh, and we, we tend to say that, you know, the site under their supervision is that they own the site. Uh, so anything that happens, all the liability, they assume the risk for all of that while the project is under construction and until the project is turned over back to uh, Northeastern University. Questions there? Great. Um, hi, I'm Megan. I'm a senior in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. Thank you all for being here. Um, I was curious, you mentioned earlier that you also manage our global projects and that a recent focus of the university is sustainability and resiliency. I'm curious to know how that relates to campuses that we've acquired, such as the London campus and the Oakland campus, and kind of, um, I guess, coming in with this approach what the future for those campuses look like, if there's any community pushback from the existing communities and just kind of how you've navigated all of that coming into the space as kind of an outsider or like an international outsider especially. Let me take them separately because they are in different buckets, I'll say. Uh, London is still a, we do not, we, did, we acquired a, a, you know, NCH, but the property we did not acquire. Uh, we lease space in London. And there are certain requirements that we had to really get a good handle on. We have local representation, but they have, uh, their energy project uh, is uh, run by, it's called Brian, Brian, Brian. And we have, you know, the, the owners of the buildings that we occupy require us to do any renovation and not impact their certification, right? And so we wouldn't do that. We totally, and as, as a matter of fact, it's, um, it's really uh, nice when we, uh, you know, engage with an owner that has that requirement because we also realize that they, too, um, hold it in high regard, right, sustainability. So on the campuses like that, Charlotte, uh, London, Seattle, uh, we tried to go by the local requirements uh, and make sure that we don't impact any certification that they have. We are in discussions, and you know, as I mentioned, our our hub is is in just a year in, and so we're get they're getting a bit of better handle on even just Boston, but they have already, you know, basically alerted us that they're going to go in and they're going to have requirements for uh, all of our teams uh, throughout the global network and have standards to make sure that we are meeting the standards that we have even for Boston. So that's, those are those. Oakland is a different um, ball game. And we have, uh, Aaliyah has hired someone, so we have someone on site that is a sustainability manager. And so we are totally committed there to making sure that we're applying um, even, you know, making sure that we are elevating even the standards that already exist in Oakland uh, with that same. Thank you. Um, I'm Tori Schwiez. I'm with our Climate Justice and Sustainability Hub at Northeastern. Work with Cassandra and Jacqueline and the team. Um, thank you for the question. I was just saying, Cassandra did a really nice summary of explaining we have a different, we have a network that is, that is really variable. Uh, and, and so the solutions are going to be really variable as well. And we're digging into those. And I, I'm glad that you elevated to the points of sustainability in our built infrastructure, but also how it relates to community, which we saw in some of these um, rating systems and we know is important. And that really is a focus as well. And you certainly see like in Oakland, there, there has been uh, at, from Mills College, a strong connection with community there and we'll continue to build on that. Uh, and, it, and it is important too in, in the other uh, campuses. And so we're figuring out both for, for properties we own as well as properties that, that we lease, how we can 
as an impact. Yeah, before we get back to uh, Cassandra's elaboration on that, um, o Oakland is an interesting example uh, because the campus, um, the Mills College campus, is twice the size of the Boston campus and uh, is, is a kind of uh, green and verdant uh, campus that looks like a traditional college campus based on all the pictures we've seen. Um, but the pictures are also the kinds of pictures that um, uh, colleges like to put out of um, how wonderful the, the space actually is. And, uh, you know, we see walkways and trees and, and old buildings and what have you, which, of course, creates the impression um, that it's uh, this perfectly maintained, beautiful site. And apparently, in reality, windows have had to be replaced. Um, there's a lot of maintenance work, deferred maintenance work that wasn't done. And the university uh, the, from uh, Boston and, and the Oakland perspectives has made a substantial investment in addressing, as I understand things, um, many years of deferred maintenance uh, to, to bring the space up to what it should be. Um, and part of what I wonder is, um, isn't there a way for us to tell that story um, in, in a way that shows that our acquisition of that campus um, is in fact something that has been beneficial uh, to uh, the future of that campus and the surrounding community. Um, uh, because clearly a, a campus that uh, is more sustainable, uh, more resilient, um, uh, more efficient, uh, is is a more of an asset to the community than one that is uh, deteriorating because the uh, uh, the school may not have the resources uh, to really uh, invest in the asset. And as we move forward, I just wonder whether there isn't a way uh, to uh, tell the story of how the university is in fact enhancing. Uh, sustainability, even as it is globalizing, and in fact, uh, to tell the story um, of how uh, the university's commitment uh, to sustainability is in fact helping to um, make all of these campuses that, that uh, we are now responsible more for more sustainable. And then you were going to Short answer is yes. <laughs> um, and if you think about, at least from the press, is how we uh, call ourselves planning real estate and facilities, uh, our first two hires were, in fact, on the facility side, on the maintenance side, to help get some of the deferred maintenance um, work in, you know, in progress and sustainability. Uh, those were the two first hires that uh, we, on the facility side, on the prep side, uh, there were other hires, obviously, to support the students, but um, those are the t first two out of the gate for us. And then we'll follow up with, you know, project management, et cetera. Um, the point I was going to try and make is the other thing that we are very committed to, again, planning you know, under the things that are under our control, are uh, workforce, local uh, workforce development in Oakland. Um, as we put out RFPs, as we talk to companies, because as you could imagine, there are many companies have, you know, started knocking on the door that are national companies that have a presence as they say, oh, we, you know, we have, we have an office in Oakland. I said, is it in Oakland? Is it on the East Bay or is it in San Francisco? Uh, well, it's in San Francisco. Well, I'm not looking for that, right? I'm looking for East Bay. We're looking for the East Bay. We want to make sure that we are going in and really injecting in the economic development in and around the Oakland campus. Uh, and so that, that's a commitment that um, Kathy and, and we've made to try and, uh, under the things that are under our control, the contracts that we're putting out, we're trying uh, the best, our best to really just contract with local representation to Oakland.
Yeah, and, I, and there again, I'm curious. Um, as uh, the university is asked to um, develop and then present master plans for these various campuses, wouldn't that process of uh, some of our internal commitment uh, and uh, documentation of not so much your conversation with a you know national uh, supplier of dumpsters or something, but uh, the, 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 the manifestation of our commitment to doing local workforce development and, and local procurement and the like be helpful in terms of then uh, being able to project out that our master planning efforts uh, now consistently um, are about engaging communities in a way where we've learned from what we did before and uh, are, are now prepared to apply those learnings uh, moving forward. We have other questions or comments. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned about community engagement. I wonder that how you engage with students and what opportunities you have for students, uh, particularly at, you know, at a sustainability hub or facility center, you know, for the graduate students, how they can also utilize their skill sets or how they can help you to achieve your vision for, you know, climate resilience campuses in, in Boston and around the world. So I think we, you know, being a Northeastern department, we have co-ops um, and uh, love the co-op program and have students in in that way. Um, we do student hearings sometimes. Um, I mentioned the survey, so that's one way that we can get a lot of student engagement um, and holding um, something that's a little bit quicker and uh, over the internet. Um, but I would say that going forward, we're always looking for ways to expand that. Um, you know, there's programs with the city for interns and, and even, you know, ways to get, you know, local community students involved, not just our own students. Um, yeah, I don't know, Cassandra, if you have anything to add to that, but. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're trying to get better about bringing our own students out to sites as they're being constructed. Jillian led an amazing tour while we were <laughs> building the bridge. Um, we've got, you know, Cassandra alluded to a 90-person tour that we're doing on Tuesday for architecture students at EXP. Um, I think, you know, getting students to come out to um, real world happening, you know, building as it's happening um, is an amazing opportunity to, for them, but it also, you know, they ask great questions while we're, while we're doing the projects. And so it's always great to get that extra perspective um, while you're doing the work. I'll just add, we have an amazing campus planning team that uh, is, has really engaged with the students and brought them in. And we're evaluating uh, how can we do it better? How can we have uh, more meetings where we could share some of the things that we're thinking about? But the master plan, of course, is the biggest one right now that they've done a lot of outreach uh, and they've had some student um, participation in that, uh, we, when we are doing a, the design of a major structure, typically we've done several town hall meetings um, and allow, you know, brought the community in and we've done, you know, allowed for questions, et cetera. But for the most part, I think, yeah, and we did that for the bridge actually. When ICC was built, we had a few town hall meetings there. But um, yeah, there's always ways that we could do it better and we're looking for feedback from the student community. And if I could just uh, elaborate uh, a little bit further on that point, uh, what we found uh, through uh, these open classroom sessions uh, is that there is broader and deeper uh, interest across the campus um, than um, many of us might have uh, understood initially. Um, so that when we're building something, it turns out that the architecture students and the engineering students are interested. But then we've also heard from archaeology students 
We've heard certainly from business students. Uh, we've heard from policy students. Um, we've heard from students who are involved with uh, health sciences. And in a variety of ways, um, they have uh, shown an interest in the built environment um, in, in a way where it's clear that they want to be more engaged. Um, not so much as critics, but really as, as students. Uh, they want to learn um, how and why some of the projects uh, that have uh, evolved on campus over the last decade uh, have come into being and been executed. And particularly as students are focusing increasingly on environmental justice and the like, um, they're asking increasingly, uh, what can we learn from this that we can apply once we graduate and uh, then go to work for Goldman Sachs, for example? Or uh, uh, what, what can we learn about this as we go to work for a Skanska? Um, and uh, because uh, this university is um, expanding, uh, but, but is not going to disappear anytime soon, um, there is uh, tremendous learning uh, that is generated by our simply being a corporate citizen who's building um, a lot of facilities here in Oakland and elsewhere. Um, so it, 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 it then does become an interesting challenge to figure out um, how to engage uh, the ultimate client users of many um, of these properties in uh, the development and understanding of how they are um, and, and can be uh, sustainable and resilient. Thank you. Just Add one uh, more opportunity for students who are interested onto that. Uh, Cassandra earlier mentioned uh, climate justice and structural oppression training. That's part of a larger, that's sort of a, it was a foundational piece for our university's climate justice action plan that we're working. We're getting a deep understanding of what community needs are and those impacted. And students are more than welcome. Um, we have a climate justice fellowship that is really following that whole process along. Um, but we also have opportunities to whatever uh, extent you are able to um, contribute and particularly upcoming there are two uh, community conversations in April and we would love to have students show up to those um, more. So please check it out. There's an Earth Month calendar on the Planning Real Estate and Facilities website. You can find some of the details for that and other activities like this event on there. I think we, we should find a way to bring you uh, off into the classroom. I think uh, we need to get the industry, for example. I think we discussed the landing stations, because that's also been done by you and it got uh, platinum. Is that right? Uh, France? OK. Uh, the, the landing station? Oh, landing. Uh, I forgot what it is. I think it was more than one. Yes. So I, I think we, we need to get you uh, in the classroom. Uh, and these three examples, or these two examples of the sites and, and the lead and, and the envision are kind of the practice. So we, we are teaching sustainability and resilience in different classes. We are talking about this in different classes. But this is a kind of a show and tell. And this is the walking the talk that you, you, you mentioned in the beginning. So we need to figure out uh, collaborations uh, between the industry, between the practitioners and the classroom. Uh, because um, as you were saying, we can tell the story. Uh, we, we have done it here in Northeastern University. We can replicate it. We can do it uh, in other, um, other site, uh, in other place. So um, help us to think of a way. I know you guys are very uh, busy, but we we, we need to think of ways that we, we do this again and we do it in different venues. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank That's you very much. Fascinating group, and let's thank our, uh, our presenters.